Hello and welcome to Pots and Trowels. It's Thursday the 8th of October, it's seven o'clock and we're live in the potting shed. And tonight we're gonna to be having a quick look around the garden. We're gonna be doing bits and bobs in the potting shed to look at autumn plants. And we're gonna be answering some of your gardening questions. Well, the nights are really drawing in now um, and it's dark by about quarter to seven where we are in North Yorkshire. So we're forced into the potting shed, but we wanted to come inside because autumn is a really good time. Everybody has got things in the garden that look good at this time of the year, but some people also think that autumn is the end of the gardening year, but it's not because if you think about it, it's the perfect time to be planting trees, shrubs, perennials, bulbs in the garden. There's pruning to be done. And there are lots and lots of plants that I think are at their best at this time of the year. So we're gonna look at some of those a little bit later on, just to show you what does look good in the garden. And as I said earlier, we're gonna be answering some of your questions. So please, please do get in touch with us. You can get in touch with us via the Facebook page. We've got Jill and Sean here in the background, beavering away, Sean's operating the desk and swapping the cameras, Jill's making notes and holding up cue cards for me because I always forget what I'm gonna say. So we will be doing lots uh, over the next half an hour or so. So depends how many questions we get from you. You can forget television tonight, just keep watching us here on Pots and Trowels. I thought what we would do is start off with something that I started last autumn because I love to bring plants from the garden either in the house or bring them near to the house so that we can enjoy them. And through the winter, I love to see the lovely colored stems that we get on the dogwoods, the lovely cornice and on the willows. They look great. And what I do is just go and cut them when the leaves have fallen off, but you can do it now. You can cut them early and strip the leaves off. And I've made a very, very simple wreath like this. Now you might be thinking this doesn't look anything like a wreath but this is just the very very start of it, how we start it off and what I've done is cut some coloured stems from the garden, strip the leaves off them like this and then I've just started to form them into a circle and I use a little bit of wire initially just to hold them in place and you can then build it up. You need quite a lot more and it's just then a case of getting the stems and just weaving them in around, twisting them in and the more you do this, and it's not gonna work now, is it? But the more you do it, the, the more it will get the structure and the circle and you just keep going round. And if they spring out, just put a little bit of wire on and just keep going round and round and round. And you can build up this lovely wreath, just very simple of all the lovely colored stems and hang that outside. And that will look really attractive all the way through the winter with the reds and the oranges and the purple stems in there. So you can be doing that anytime now. And I did one, this time last year, uh, hung it on a wall and it looked great over the winter, but now it's sadly dried out. It's all gone very dry, very brittle. What I do when I finish it, I've got some very thin wire and I just bind it round it just to hold it all together. Now, I don't like throwing things away. So I thought, what can I do to jazz this up a little bit and make it look attractive through the autumn? So what I've been doing this afternoon is I've been wandering around the garden and I've been cutting various bits of evergreen. So things like the lovely choice ear that's actually got a few flowers on there, lovely foliage, got a bit of a scent to it. I've been cutting this flomis here. This is uh, the Jerusalem sage, so that's silvery gray foliage, a dwarf laurel, prunus otto lichen, all sorts of things, fetinia, viburnum, all sorts evergreens from the garden and what I want to do with this and I have never done this before this is just an idea that Jill suggested in the week so I thought I'll go for it and you know what better thing to do than make yourself look a fool doing something live than this so I'm going to try and turn this into an autumn wreath so you've got to bear with me so it's quite difficult to push things in so I'm using a screwdriver now if you think about it evergreens if you cut an evergreen at this time of the year they will stay fresh without water for several weeks. If you buy a wreath at Christmas uh, to decorate your front door or something like that, that will have been made probably the middle to the end of November and it will still be looking good right into the new year. So certainly you'll get a couple of months. So I've been and cut lots of little stems. So what I'm gonna do is just using the screwdriver because I can't push them through, I'm gonna open up the gaps between and I'm just gonna push 
some stems in and I've cut them to three or four inches. I'm doing it in no particular order. I'm just pushing them in because what I want it to do is look like a, a evergreen garland. So I'm just literally making this up as I go along. I haven't got a clue what I'm doing. If it is a disaster, then so be it. But you've got to try these things. Otherwise, you don't know if they're going to work. So I'm just using the screwdriver to push pieces of foliage down and arranging the colours so I can then enjoy all these lovely shrubs that we're growing in the garden that will be hanging on our wall. So we're going to carry on doing this. Now, if you only just joined us on Pots and Trowels, welcome. We're going to be with you for a while. This is our third Pots and Trowels Live. Um, it's your chance to ask a question live if you want, or you can just sit back on the settee and have a glass of wine um, and do whatever you want, really. So we're really pleased that you're with us. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to carry on pushing these in, but hopefully now you just get a bit of an idea. Now, you can do this however you want. You can go all the way around if you want, or just do sort of a little swag at the base and have something trailing down it. So I'm going to carry on doing this for a few more minutes um, just to see if I can make it look something like and in the meantime we're going to show you a short film because today we've had quite a sunny day here in North Yorkshire and earlier on Sean went out with a video camera just had a wander around the garden to see what's looking good and to catch Jill doing a bit of work in the garden. Oh well, there you go. So there's still quite a lot of colour in the garden. Could have done with that being just a bit longer because I'm not getting on quite as fast as I thought with this. So what I'm doing is I'm working my way round. Now I've got these lovely little crab apples uh, from the garden. Unfortunately I don't know the variety. I could find out I suppose but it's a, a lovely little uh, crab apple, tiny ones that stay on here right the way through the winter. So I just thought they would add that lovely sort of autumn feel to it. So I'm just pushing a few sprigs of those into this as well. Um, so it really is anything you've got in the garden that is looking good at this time of the year. Um, flower heads, dried flower heads you can put in there just to add that bit of colour. And as I said, evergreens will stay green for a long time. So I'm just going to put a couple more bits in here and then it's something that I can probably finish off tomorrow when I've got just a little bit more time um, and make it so that it looks good when it's hanging out there. Let's put a bit of this choice in, it's a lovely colour in there. So it's not finished, so don't judge me on it, oh, I just want a bit more there. The trouble is you could just keep going and going and going with this um, and spend loads of time. So what I would do with this when it's finished, I'm going to hang it on a wall. Now I'm not going to hang it in a really sunny position because it would probably fry on a sunny day. So if you put it on a shady wall, 
And then every now and again, just give it a bit of a mist with some water just to help keep it fresh. And I reckon this will stay sort of green and fresh for at least a month. And if something does look a bit dry on it, then you just pull it out and you replace it with one or two more bits. So it really is something that you can keep adding to and keep changing right the way through the autumn. And then you could redo it again, of course, if you wanted to for the winter, put some holly and ivy on there and different berries. So are we ready for the big reveal? Just push that one in there. Just want one more little bit, just another little bit in there. Oh, it's quite nerve wracking this. I feel as if I'm being watched. Have we got lots of people watching us, by the way? Hello, if you've just joined us, by the way. If you're wondering what I'm doing, I haven't really got much of a clue. I'm just doing this little, little autumn arrangement. And the more I look at it, the more I keep adding little bits into it. But I've got to stop now because we've got questions that we need to answer. So, there you go. Hopefully, that will give you a bit of an idea. And I've no idea which camera I'm on. Uh, I'm on this camera here. So, there you go. Hopefully, that gives you a bit of an idea. That's going to hang on the wall. Oh, we haven't got a nail. Where, where, where haven't we got a nail to hang this up? Um, I'll get one. <laughs> I'll get one in a bit. So, yes. So, it's just to bring a bit of autumn joy to the house so that we can enjoy it. So, there you go. Have a go with a little autumn wreath. You can play around with it to your heart's content. Jeanette likes the apples. Jeanette, Jeanette likes the apples. Yeah, they are lovely. I'm not sure. It might be one called Everest, but I think they're a bit redder. But it is a lovely little crab apple. And the, the birds in the new year, well, the, the blackbirds and the thrushes and the field fairs really, really do like them. So, I'm going to grab my stool, sit down and answer some questions. We've had some questions already sent in, but you've still got time to send them in if you want to. Um, this is a question about blueberries, and this one is from Julie, and she wants to know if they can be grown successfully in large pots, and do they need a special compost? She's tried before, but she's not had particularly good results, and she wonders if the frost has killed them off or done damage to them uh, when it's been very cold. And she just bought a young plant, and she wants to know whether she should keep it in the greenhouse over winter till it grows a bit, and, and when should they be pruned? Well, yes, the answer, Julie, is you can grow them in pots. Uh, this is a blueberry that's been in this pot uh, for quite a few years, as you can see. Um, it's not a huge pot, really. Um, it's probably ready now for going into a slightly bigger pot in the spring. And it's growing in ericaceous compost, and this lives outside 12 months of the year. It's grown in a fruit cage so that the birds don't get the berries, and we normally get a really good crop of them off there. You've got to keep them well watered, and if possible, try and water it with a rainwater because they need those acidic conditions and we feed it with an acid plant feed every now and again and it's just developing these lovely autumn tints because the leaves will fall off they are deciduous they're really good for autumn color when it comes to pruning the time to do it is when the leaves have fallen off and it's just a little bit of thinning out really where we've got long shoots i might just shorten them back a little bit take the top out of that but the idea is to get a really twiggy bushy plant and that's where you'll get the blossoms and the fruits next year if you've only just bought a small plant then yes i would leave it in the original pot doesn't need any heat but if you've got a cold greenhouse that will just give it that little bit of protection over the winter if you put it into a big pot now and surround it with compost it might get waterlogged it doesn't like to be waterlogged it likes to be moist but not waterlogged so uh, good luck with that so um, this is from Joan. She'd like to know, how do I ripen my sweet peppers? They're still green. Well, uh, we've still got some green ones on our peppers. The secret is to keep them as warm as you can. So I don't know where yours are growing, Joan, but if you can possibly put them either in a greenhouse, if you've got one, or if you've got a conservatory, or even just a windowsill that is really light, then pop them in there, uh, keep them moist but not wet, and you can still give them a little bit of a high potash feed, a tomato feed, and indoors they will carry on growing and they should ripen, but it's keeping them warm. If you've got them outside, it's too cold, um, so they just need that little bit of warmth just to, to encourage them to ripen along. Um, Carol says, hi Martin, one of my cherry trees that I've trained into an arch is weeping gunk 
at the base. Nice description there, Carol. The leaves are all good and it's produced cherries this year. What should I do? Well, you have sent a photograph of this um, um, when you sent the question in on Facebook to us, Carol. And uh, I must admit, when I first saw it, I was quite worried because I thought straight away bacterial canker. Bacterial canker is a problem on cherries and plums, all members of the pruners family. And one of the symptoms that you get is when you get this sticky gum coming out of the bark, it's sort of little cracks in the bark, and yours is quite bad around the base. It's a process known as gumosis, or I think it's something like that, I'll be told if it's not. But anyway, you get this sticky resiny gum that oozes out of them. Now, bacterial canker is gonna be in the tree, um, but you often get other telltale signs. So one of them is you get bits of dye back on there, so you'll get little shoots that die back, and you also get a thing called shot hole, which I is... Can, show the picture, can we not? show the picture to everybody? Yeah, yeah. So the picture, there it is. Uh, thanks, Sean. So as you can see, that's Carol's gumming on her prunus there on this cherry. Um, and it, it is quite bad, and it's around the base. But you get the shot hole where you've got lots of little holes in the leaves and that's another indication the two go hand in hand now if above that point the tree is really healthy and it's the leaves look green and there's no shot hole in there and you're getting no dye back then that gumming could be environmental things it could have been drought that's affected the rootstock that it's been grafted onto it could be weather fluctuations it could be just stress generally stressed to the tree and it looks that it's coming from the base where the rootstock is. So I'm keeping my fingers crossed that it might not be bacterial canker, that it just might be stress on the tree. So keep your eye on it. If you can scrape a little bit of that away, do. Um, in the spring, make sure that you feed the tree, keep it healthy, keep it growing so it's not under stress. If it's dry, keep it watered. Maybe give it a good mulch of compost. See how it goes. Um, they will often live with bacterial canker for a number of years, so I, I wouldn't certainly get rid of it yet. I think it's just to keep your eye on it and see how it goes. Um, Bernie has been in touch. Bernie's grown some pak choy from seed in a pot that was planted in mid-August. Uh, and Bernie would like to know if it's okay to overwinter it in a warm, sunny room. Well, pak choy will overwinter, um, but it doesn't want to be too warm. It's quite tough, really. I, I often grow it in the polytunnel, and it will keep well into winter, even in a cold polytunnel. So if you've got it in a really warm room, I think it will just stretch, and it will probably actually run to seed. It will flower and go to seed. So I wouldn't do that if it's in a warm room. Somewhere cool, if you've got a cool windowsill or if you've got a conservatory, that would be ideal for it. And somewhere where there's really good light is what you need. Uh, Ian would like to know what to do with asparagus growth over the winter, something we covered last year on Pots and Trowels. Um, ours is still fairly green, just starting to yellow, but when it goes a really yellow color and looks like it's starting to die down, Ian, then that's the time to cut it down to ground level, get rid of it, shred it all, put it on the compost heap so that you're clearing the site. But at the moment, while it's green, it's still feeding the plant um, and building up those roots for next year. Um, we've got a question now from Malcolm. Malcolm has been in touch um, and he says, I don't know if you've got time for this or maybe for another evening. Well, Malcolm, no, we can do it this evening. He's picked all the apples and pears from his four vertical uh, four-year-old cordons and they need to be pruned and he says he gets confused well I know the feeling Malcolm I'm always confused um, when to get the offshoots from the side shoots and how he has to prune them and how many leaves you've got to leave on there so he's asked if we can demonstrate well it's pitch black outside Malcolm but luckily earlier today Sean and I popped into the fruit garden and did a bit of pruning to show you how to do it well, Malcolm, this is a cordon apple. It's not quite vertical, it's leaning a little bit, but this is very similar, I'm sure, to what you've got. And pruning is very simple. You can do it any time from late August till about this time of the year. I've still got a few apples to pick on this one. It's a variety called Red Love. It's a small red apple. Uh, it's quite an interesting apple, actually, this one, is because when you cut it in half, I'll just do this one for you now, it's got red flesh in there as well. It's an eating apple, really hardy, suitable for the north of England and that's what it looks like inside but even though it's an eating apple you have to leave it until about the middle of October because it's quite sour otherwise so I'll pop that one there 
I'll take that in for Jill later. So the pruning, what we're aiming to do is we're cutting off all this year's growth back to short growth that we cut back to last year that we call spurs. And this is a really good example here. Sean can come in. That's where I pruned it to last year, just where my finger is just there. And we can see the blossom grew and we've got apples on there. So normally then the new growth that's been made, we're gonna cut back to a couple of inches. It's not an exact science. Some people cut them back really hard, some people cut them back longer, but I normally go two, three buds, something like that. And it's literally just a case of working your way up the tree, cutting all these long new shoots back to just two or three buds back to where they grew from. Now, if you did it earlier on and you've got a side shoot, cut that off as well, just cut it back. So it's on these little short growths that we've got here that the blossom will develop and we will get the fruit next year and then it will make another shoot and we do the whole thing again next year. So it really is simple. Don't worry about it. Get your secateurs and just have a happy half hour pruning your apples. So there you go, Malcolm, happy pruning, and I'm sure you'll get it right. They'll be absolutely fine. So if you've just tuned in and wonder what we're doing, you're watching Pots and Trials. We are live in the potting shed tonight on Facebook Live. Um, we're answering questions, so you've still got time to put them in, although we've got loads and loads that are coming in as we speak. So I'm going to try and rattle through them as quickly as I can, because I've got some plants that I want to show you as well that are looking good at this time of the year. Um, I've got to say hello to, I haven't got my, uh, my glasses on. I would like to say hello to Seamus from Cork. Um, so hello Seamus. Patricia's going to have a go at wreath making. Sean, a bit of paper's just fallen off. Uh, good luck and send us a picture. Uh, so with that, and Deborah says hi from Nottinghamshire. Hello to everybody in Nottinghamshire. Uh, right, Diane uh, has said she's lost an apple tree this year and a second one is going the same way. The leaves are going brown and crisp and the apples don't develop. What can I do to save it? Well, um, it's been a bit of a strange year, to be fair. Uh, lots of apple leaves on our trees have gone crispy, which is due to stress, I think, this year. We've had hot weather, we've had cold weather, we've had wet weather, we've had dry weather, we've had windy weather. Uh, they've had mildew, they've had aphid infestations. So um, it might not be dead. Now, if it is dead, then obviously that's something's affected the root. But at the moment, lots of trees and fruit bushes look a bit tatty. So what could you do to save the one you've got? Well, maybe a little bit of pruning in the winter to take out any dead wood, any crowded wood, overcrowded shoots, just to open it up a little bit more and then feed it in the spring. Give it a good general feed, uh, dried poultry pellets or blood fish and bone, just sprinkled around where the roots are. Give it a mulch just to give it a boost. You want it to put on some nice new vigorous growth. So good luck with that. David said he's got first year gladioli um, and most of them have flowered, that's great news. Um, how do you overwinter them? Do you dig them up and store or cover with leaf mulch? And he's in Staffordshire. I tend to dig them up for the simple reason, if you leave them in and we get a mild winter, they'll survive. But when a gladioli bulb has finished flowering, it produces, a, well it's, a, it's actually a corm, it produces a new corm above the original one, but then you get dozens of tiny little, what we call cormlets, really small, and they won't flower, and they just grow like bits of grass. So you'll finish up with this mass of growth next year, and probably less flowers. So as soon as they start to die down now, I dig them up out the garden, uh, save the new big corm, and it's obvious which one it is, and I throw the rest away, and then replant those again again next year and just keep them somewhere cool and frost free. Um, Hilary says when to lift dahlia tubers. Well again some people leave their dahlia tubers in. I prefer to take them out the ground when they've been frosted. We've had a couple of ground frosts here but nothing severe. So probably you know end of October, November when, when we've had some sharp frost and they've gone black cut them down to ground level, dig them up and keep them somewhere cool and frost free and then plant them again next April, May time. And I think that way that they overwinter better. They're not going to be damaged by the wet weather or slugs and snails that are nibbling on the shoots. Um, question from Bud and Leaf. Um, what should I do with small wallflower plants grown from seed? Can I put them in winter pots? Absolutely. They look great in containers. They're not going to flower till next April. So what I tend to do is to plant them in pots, but below them put a few daffodils so they will flower first and then when they finish you'll get the wallflowers into flower and Jeanette said uh, when should I cut back buddleia 
Um, we do the hard pruning usually in March time in spring to promote strong new growth that will flower. But what I normally do about this time of the year is to cut them down by half so they can get to six, eight, ten feet tall. And if we get a windy, wet winter, they rock around and it can damage the roots. So I take them down by half, just cut them off, and then in March we take them down even lower. Um, right. Uh, Iwa has sent a question in saying, Hi Martin, my raspberries suffered a horrible blight of some kind and I've been told to burn all the canes and plant new ones in a different part of the garden. Should I treat the soil where the canes have been with anything to make it look egg for new plants? To make it okay for the new plants. Sorry, I can't read the writing. Um, thank you. Well, um, I've had a look at the pictures that you sent in of the raspberries and to be honest mine look very similar so again I grabbed Sean this afternoon he was normally having a snooze about three o'clock um, just to prepare himself for tonight but I said get your camera come with me and let's look at these raspberries well as you can see my raspberries don't look particularly good either and from the photograph you've sent in they look very similar to this it's not blight raspberries don't get blight like potatoes and I think the problem is weather we've had a really strange growing season this year we had it very hot and dry to start with they were slow to get going then we've had it wet we've had it windy the leaves on these have been shredded they've been battered by the wind and they've also got a deficiency and where we've got this sort of veining in the leaf here this is magnesium deficiency where you get the green veins and the pale in between and that again I think it's because we've had hot, we've had dry, we've had wet so the plants are all over the place so I'm not going to worry too much about these. This is an autumn variety called Joan Jay. Um, we're still getting one or two fruits down here look we're still picking a few raspberries the very late ones here we might just get one or two more what I'm going to do with these is just let them die down the leaves will fall off I'll get rid of them and then in the spring They'll be pruned down to ground level. I'll give them a really good feed with an organic fertiliser. I'll mulch them with compost that we're making. And I hope next year they'll grow much better. So if it were me, I would leave yours, give them another chance, but just give them a little bit of TLC and nurture them. I think I just missed you eating a raspberry while I was focusing on the leaves. Have you just eaten one? I've just eaten one. <laughs> yeah, do you want one? Yeah, go on. Enjoy it. Right, there you go. So good luck with those. I definitely would give them a go um, and see what happens next year with a bit more loving care, more fertiliser and if it's dry, give them a water. So I thought we'd look at a few plants uh, that are looking good at this time of the year because I know there's lots of autumn colour coming on the trees. We're getting some lovely shades of foliage out there. So I've just been around the garden and picked a few things that I really like at this time of the year. I'm, I'm a great fan of foliage anyway and stem colours. So these are some of the dogwoods that are just starting to colour up now. This one is a lovely dark stem called Kessel Ringii and it's developing lovely autumn foliage. And this is one called Spathii that will have red stems. It's got variegated leaves. And again, these will colour up over the next few weeks. So they're really good for not just autumn colour, but they're gonna look great right the way through the winter time. Um, this is one of my favourite shrubs. It's one of those that some people don't like it, but I do. It's Lysisteria formosa, but this is the golden form called golden lanterns. And it's got this lovely golden foliage, but then you get these sort of racemes of flowers hanging that then develop into these lovely sort of ruby red berries that hang all the way through the winter. The birds love them, so it's great for attracting wildlife and birds into the garden. And although it is deciduous, it seems to hang onto its foliage well, well into late autumn. So it's a really good one. And I also like contrasts of colour. So I love purples growing against golden. And this is a vine that we've got growing over the pergola. This is Vitus purpurea. It does produce um, grapes on it, but they're not really edible. They're really hard little grapes. But I just love the foliage. It's purple, but then at this time of the year, they go a much brighter red color. Um, and they just look really good, just draping over them as they fall onto the leaf, uh, onto the lawn, sorry. Um, evergreens, again, 
lots of different evergreens with coloured foliage. This is a, a type of fetinia. Um, I think it's marble pink, this one. It's got a, a variegated leaf. I love variegated leaves in the garden. And another one that I've got here is one of the Portuguese laurels, but again with a variegated leaf. It just adds that splash of colour through the dark winter days. And then flowers, of course. Loads of flowers still in the garden. Um, the Annabelle, Pink Annabelle has suddenly decided to put some side shoots out and we've got these lovely small heads. Beautiful colour, isn't it, that Pink Annabelle? So delicate there. Um, Penstemons are still flowering. This is one called Alice Hindley. It grows to about three feet tall, so it's quite a big one. Um, and this will keep flowering until we get the first frost and then I'll deadhead it leave it until the spring and give it a good prune down and then it will start again next year. But it's one of my favourites. Just love these lovely mauve purple flowers with a white throat in there. And as geraniums go, the herbaceous geraniums, this one is a really good one. This is Roseanne. Now lots of herbaceous geraniums flower for just a few weeks in late spring and early summer and then they're just foliage for the rest of the year. But this one has been in flower since May. Uh, and it's flowered constantly. There aren't as many flowers on it now as there were in the middle of the summer, but we've still got these beautiful blue flowers with a white centre. And again, this will probably carry on for another few weeks. Here we are today, it's the 8th of October, and there's no reason why this won't still be in flower at the end of October. So it's just nice to have growing in the herbaceous borders. As is this one, it used to be called Shizo stylus. Um, but it's now had a name change and it's called Hesperantha coccinea pink princess. Um, the ordinary Shizer stylus or Hesperantha is, is a red colour, but this is a lovely pale pink, really delicate flowers. Uh, almost look a little bit like miniature gladioli. Uh, totally hardy, needs a dampish spot, not too hot, not too dry, and it doesn't start to flower until September, and this will still be flowering, I guarantee, in November. So a really good one for this time of the year. All look lovely if you put them in a vase with a bit of foliage. Um, Hookeras, often grown for the foliage, but this is one that I really like. This one is called Paris. It's a place Jill's often wanted me to take her, um, and I, I, I can't take her at the moment, so I bought her four of these Paris plants, just as a reminder of what she could have had. Um, and it flowers again all through the season, starts about May time, and it's still flowering. And, and in the midsummer, these are much taller, and you can use them as a cut flower. So Hookera Paris, and then, these, these are the Nareens, lovely autumn flowering bulb, just starting to flower in the garden. We can see they're still in bud there, a beautiful pink colour. And this one is an Amarine, which is a cross between an Nareen and an Amaryllis. Lots of lovely colours in these, different shades of pinks there. Um, and these need to be in a sunny position. Don't plant them too deep. The bulbs need to be visible. Um, so if you've got a hot, dry border, these will naturalise and get better and better every year. And these last for ages as cut flower in the house. And then just finally, because we are running out of time, but I know you didn't want to watch EastEnders or Coronation Street tonight anyway. Um, think of grasses. This is a lovely Miscanthus, and I can't remember its name, I do apologise, but it's just opening these lovely feathery fronds, and when they sway in the breeze, they look absolutely wonderful, and they've almost got like a, a golden hue to them. So there's still bags and bags of interest in the garden that you can enjoy. So if you haven't got plants that are looking good at the minute, it's perfect time to go to a garden centre, support your local nurseries, because now is not only the perfect time to enjoy them, but it's the perfect time to plant them. So there's just a few ideas of what's looking good. So we're gonna rattle through a few more questions. I've got my eye on the clock, hoping to be finished by nine o'clock. Uh, tonight, Sean's just sighing, he's ready for a drink, I can tell. <laughs> Diane says, how do I protect bottle brush trees for winter? It's in the ground. That's the uh, calistemon, of course, isn't it? Um, they're fairly tough, to be fair. Um, I don't know how long you've had it in the ground, but it, they like good drainage. They don't want to be waterlogged. If you think it's going to be very cold and we're getting minus five, six, sevens, maybe put a little bit of fleece around it. But otherwise, just, you know, I think it will be okay. Uh, Catherine said, uh, what would you recommend to reduce slugs in the garden? She's tried crushed egg shells, which work well, but any other tips? Well, they do work, but you've just got to eat so many eggs to get enough egg shells, haven't you? People use coffee grinds, they use uh, wool pellets that irritate the slugs and snails as they crawl over them. 
Grit is good if you're using it in pots. Um, so all of those will work. Nematodes, of course, although it's getting quite late in the season. And of course, I've got to mention it because, you know, lots of people still use them. Slug pellets, but not the ones based on metaldehyde, which are the poisonous ones. The ones that the organic growers use, and they're certified by organic growers, are the ones that use... Um, 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 Something else? Yeah, oh I forgot what the active ingredient is, but they're, they're the organic slug pellets, you'll find them, it'll come to me in a moment. Um, oh dear, I've just had a mental block, we'll edit this bit out, so don't worry about it. Um, it's live. It's live. Oh no, you said this was a rehearsal. Really, we're live, people are watching now. I thought we were doing it tomorrow. I thought this was just a run through. Um, it'll come to me in a moment and I'll tell you what they are, but they, they are safe for wildlife. So you could use those, but again, be very careful with them. Pat says, how do you get rid of cooch grass? She's dug out loads and still digging. You can dig and dig and dig and it's still there. This is the grass that has these underground roots. If you chop a bit off, a little bit left in the ground will grow. So you've really just got to keep forking it out as soon as you see it keep it out so little and often or again if you wanted to you could use a weed killer when it's growing in the spring but it's a bit late now to use one. Barbara's got a canna that she's had for 10 years it's uh, she plants it outside after the frosts have gone and she brings it in for winter it's never had a bloom what am I doing wrong well I think you've been really patient waiting for 10 years um, what can you do? Well, it might be worth dividing it. If it's a biggish clump, divide it because they can get quite crowded. So you wouldn't do that now. You would lift it in the autumn when it dies down, save it over the winter, and then in the spring, just as it starts into growth, then divide it into smaller pieces. Improve the soil with compost, feed it well with a high potash and plenty of water. They do like moisture, do canners, and then get it growing. And fingers crossed next year, Barbara, you'll get flowers. Uh, Martha says, thank you, love your garden. Thank you, Martha. Um, the check's in the post. Uh, she grew cosmos from seed, but haven't had any flowers and why. And Andrea Bradley uh, has got the same problem. I think that has been a bit of a problem for some people, especially the tall growing ones. No, that's not the name of it. It's you have to explain what's happening. Pheromol. You're holding up a piece of paper. The active ingredient. The active is ferrous, ferrous, ferrous. Fer ferric phosphate. Ferric phosphate is the organic slug pellet. Pheromol. Well, that's a trade name. We can't oh, advertise, okay. can we? Blimey, we'll get banned. <laughs> uh, yes, ferric phosphate uh, is the one. Um, for but Catherine and beer and beer oh beer traps yeah I'm thinking of that we'll have one later Sean um, so cosmos I think again it's probably the season I've heard of people's cosmos getting really really tall so don't start too early uh, with it that's the secret so I never sow the seed till well into April so I'm planting out in June it doesn't get a checking growth uh, and give it a potash feed uh, Rita please don't be too tidy I think this was a comment after we were doing some tidying up in the garden the other day leave cover for insects uh, I often Often find ladybirds hibernating curled up leaves like peonies in the spring that's a good point Rita and absolutely yes we mustn't be too tidy we've got to get that balance haven't we but we've got to leave some cover there for wildlife as well uh, Vicky says thanks again for all the tips it really is helpful um, to keep me uh, keep on top of the garden um, I would love to have one of those canis lupus familiaris molly plants yes well you can certainly have one if you want um, can I ask a question uh, I've got a Circe's forest pansy um, it's been in the garden for a year she didn't stake it, it was as was advised um, because it wasn't required it's put on some growth however following the winds this summer it's now leaning to one side should I now stake it to support it and if I uh, and if so do I need to prune it in the future uh, is autumn always the best time? I think that's my reading, by the way, not your question. Uh, I would. They are a little bit delicate. We've had a big chunk blow out of ours in some of the gales about a month ago. They naturally are quite spreading, sprawling trees, and they need a bit of protection. So, yes, I would stake it if it's leaning. And then if you're going to do any pruning, you can do it sort of late winter, spring. Try and keep it a bit bushier so that it doesn't spread as much. Um, Tommy. 
Can anyone advise if it's too late in the year to relocate an azalea? Uh, Tommy's in northeast Scotland where it's still mild. No, I think this is an ideal time. I don't know whether this is an evergreen, of course, or a deciduous one, but they've got quite a fibrous root system. So if it's in the ground, you could dig it up. If it's in a pot, then obviously, yes, you can move it, but do it fairly soon. Rachel, any advice on geraniums, please? Should I cut back and keep under cover? Well, if it's a geranium a zonal type, like this one here, then um, you can just keep that going. If you've got a greenhouse or a conservatory, they'll flower often through the winter. And then I cut these back a little bit more uh, in spring to promote the new growth. If it's one of the regal pelagoniums, which we cut back a while ago, and I have one here, this one's about finished flowering. What you could do with this is give it a trim. And I'm, I know we're, we are desperate for time, but basically what you could do with that now is just give it a really, really severe haircut like that and then keep that just moist and somewhere frost free and light um, and then that will make lovely bushy new growth and flower really, really well next year. So yes, you can do something to them. Um, uh, Barbara, hi, enjoyed the video on pruning. Can I ask for some advice? I have 12 small echinacea plug plants. I think these two are going to the pub. They're about to leave me. Right, okay. Yeah, I've enjoyed the video on pruning. Can I ask someone for new, uh, some advice? I have 12 small echinacea plug plants, which I've potted on as they are hardy perennials. Would you advise me to plant them out before winter comes or leave them inside till next March? Thanks, Jill. Um, I would leave them inside, Barbara. Although they are a hardy perennial, they don't like to be too wet over winter. Uh, and I find that young plants often don't survive the winter once you've planted them out into the garden. So if I ever buy any at the autumn flower shows, sadly we haven't had them this year, of course, except for the beaver flower show, uh, and Malvern, of course. But if you do buy them at this time of the year, then I tend to hold them back, keep them somewhere in a cold frame, somewhere cool and light, a greenhouse is ideal, and then plant them in the spring when they naturally want to grow. So if these are only small ones, I would keep them inside and nice and cool until next year. Um, we, um, do you want to play that now, Sean? Yeah, can you? Right, okay, we've got just a few more questions. Please stay with us, but I know we've got a load of new listeners, a load of new viewers. <laughs> It's not the radio, is it? I know, I know, I'm used to doing the radio. A lot of viewers that have just joined us. So um, earlier on today, we had a look around the garden just to look at some of the things that were looking good. So we'll play that now and then we're going to finish off with a few last questions.
So there you go, that was shorn out and about earlier today, just having a look around the garden. We had some lovely sunshine, so we took advantage of it. So thank you everybody that has joined us. We've had quite a lot of people watching this evening. We do appreciate it. Um, and we do videos, as you know, every week, and we've been doing them over a year. So if you want to look back at any of the other videos that we've done, they're all on Facebook on Pots and Trials if you scroll back a long way. But the other way to get them really quickly is to go onto YouTube. So if you go onto YouTube, Pots and Trials, you'll find the whole catalogue of all the videos we've done back way last year, so over a year. So, you know, do that. Please tell all your friends about it. Um, we do appreciate all the support that you give us. So I know we've gone way over time now. Um, Jill and Sean were... Well, I know, but you said once we go past half an hour, you two are on overtime. <laughs> so, and I, I'm not paying. So um, just the last few questions, and then I think we all deserve a little drink. Um, so Bernie um, has sent another couple of questions in. Um, when is it safe to move a healthy magnolia? It's about six feet tall and, and in a pot. Well, if it's in a pot, then it's fine to move it. But when you say move, I'm assuming you mean plant. So you can plant that out whenever you want to. The ground is still really warm. Although the air temperature is getting cooler, the ground soil is warm. So if you were to take it out of that pot now, Bernie, plant it, improve the soil, mix in a bit of compost just to give it a really good start, that will be fine. It will get its roots out and come next spring, it will grow away. And you also want to know, uh, want to know when to prune an amelanchia. Lovely, lovely spring flowering large shrub or small tree, one of my favourites. Um, I would wait until it's flowered. They flower quite early in the season. You get the lovely delicate white blossoms in April time. So enjoy that and then you can do a little bit of thinning out or shortening of any branches that are growing in the wrong direction just to improve the shape there. Uh, Teresa has asked why her Datura plant has made lots of leaves but no flowers and should she cut it down for winter in the conservatory. Well, I would let it grow for a little bit longer. They're again, reasonably tough. They do need frost protection. Um, it sounds like it's made growth at, uh, at the expense of flowers, probably because you've fed it too much with the wrong feed. Um, they need a high potash feed. So once they start to grow in the summer and make a good leaf cover, then you need to hit them with the tomato feed, a high potash feed on a regular basis, plenty of warmth, and that will then encourage the growth to produce those lovely, lovely lung trumpets Trumpets. So as for pruning, I wouldn't prune it until the springtime and then that will encourage the growth. Um, Uwe has said, thank you for the raspberry advice. Um, pleasure, good luck with them, I hope they're okay. And she's also said she's got club root on the, club root on the allotment. I am ready for a drink. Uh, what can I do? It's a difficult one because club root is a fungal disease that lives in the soil for lots of years and it affects all members of the brassica family. So all your cabbages, your cauliflowers, your brussels. So if you plant on there, it causes the roots to swell and the plants will be stunted and die. So one thing is you can start them off in pots uh, to get a good sized plant to give you a head start for when you plant them out. Uh, the other thing is there are lots of varieties now that have got resistance to it. So have a look through the seed catalogues. I know Mr. Fothergills have quite a few in their seed catalog that are resistant. There's cabbages, there's a brussel, there's a cauliflower that is resistant to club root. So they would certainly be worth trying. Um, put lime on the ground. Uh, it doesn't like limey soil club root. So put lots of lime on the plots uh, February time before you plant out in the spring or consider growing in some raised beds with some fresh soil. So good luck with that. Um, Sandra has got two purple hebes, um, 20 inches high and quite bushy and she wants to move them because they're by the front door. Can I move them now and put them in pots till next year? Yes, I think you can. 20 inches high. They've probably been in a couple of years, but if you dig them up with a good root ball so and then put them into big pots, <clears throat> Excuse me, I think they'll be okay. So I would do it sooner rather than later, uh, but you must get a good big root ball to do it. Um, and I think, oh, there's one left. I think it's this one. David, what's the best way to get rid of an infestation? Oh no, there's more. <clears throat> Excuse me, I've got, I've got to stop now. David wants to know the best way to get rid of an infestation of bamboo in the garden. <sighs> Tough, get all your friends round 
ask them to bring a spade. Well, you can only probably have six at a time, of course, but get five of your friends to come round, get yourself um, some bottles of wine or beer, uh, give them a few drinks and then say, start and dig it up. Um, and I think that's the only way. It's got a really tough root and you've got to keep on it because it will grow back if you leave the root in. Uh, again, you could use a weed killer if you want, but you're going to finish up with dead bamboo that still needs digging out. So personally, I think the best way is just to dig it out in, to start with. And this really is the final question uh, because my throat is getting very dry and I can see there's a, a little drink waiting on a tray there. Um, Elizabeth, she's cut back her lavender. Uh, sh uh, should she keep it moist over winter? Well, if it's in the garden, it will be moist. Um, I'm assuming it's in the garden. So, no, you don't need to water it. We're going to get... We're getting enough rain certainly from falling above and even if it's in a pot, lavender doesn't like to be over wet in the winter. More lavender is killed by being in wet soggy soils. So if you think it is drying out, then yes, give it a drop of water. Keep an eye on it, but certainly it won't need anywhere near the amount of water that you would normally give it uh, during the summer when it's actively growing. So that's it. I think we've answered everybody's questions. I hope we have. I apologise if we've missed any out, but uh, I know Jill's been busy around the back checking the Facebook and Sean has as well. So what have we got here, Mrs Fish? Well, we've got a bit of pear and walnut cake. Pear and walnut yeah, cake? and a little warming whiskey. Oh, is this some whiskey? whiskey? Um, and Seamus. <clears throat> sent a message he's going to keep listening to pots and trowels oh right Seamus thank you he says we're welcome to join us anytime at the pub but it's a long way to come for a pint though oh you never know we we might do it so yes so thank you very much for watching everybody um so I'm gonna have a bit of pear and walnut cake um there's only two pieces mm. Mm, sorry Why? well I didn't realize it was for later <laughs> and we're gonna raise our glass Sean would you like a little Thing. It's quite cold outside. Well, we're in the shed, but it's quite cold in the shed. So cheers to Sean. Cheers to Jill. Thank you for your help. Thank you to all of you that have been watching us. We will be back on Thursday with another Pots and Trials with more hints and tips for things that you can be doing in your garden in October. So we'll see you soon and take care and look after yourself. Cheers.